Hello again, welcome back. I think there is a myth here in the west of Ireland that you cannot grow vegetables outside without the aid of a polytunnel. Polytunnel is a big business here and anyone who's anyone seems to have one. Um, they're also very expensive um, and I don't have one. I used to have a greenhouse but it got destroyed when the beast from the east hit a few years ago. Um, so everything that I grow now is grown outside. I don't even have any raised beds, apart from two very small ones up near the caravan. Um, so it's all grown outside in um, old-fashioned beds dug in the grass. Um, and I want to debunk this myth that you can't grow things outside um, without using a polytunnel because I don't think it's true. And, you know, this is my fourth year now of um, growing vegetables here and we have some pretty harsh um, conditions, you know, very strong winds blowing in from the, um, the north and the west and quite cool summers. We don't have blazing hot summers usually and lots and lots of rain, of course. Everyone knows Ireland's famous for that. Um, and I know quite a significant um, proportion of my audience, uh, you guys are living in Ireland, so, or the UK. So you live in similar conditions in a similar kind of climate to me. Um, and I want to demonstrate that if you're in a position where you would like to um, grow your own food, but you don't yet want to spend hundreds or even thousands on a polytunnel or a greenhouse, then I want to show that you really don't need to do that, that you can grow things directly in the ground with great, great success. So that's what this video is all about. So why not just buy a polytunnel? Wouldn't it make your life easier? Um, well, there's a few considerations. First of all, and I've mentioned this already, is the cost. They aren't cheap, um, especially if you're not sure how much you want to, how much time you want to spend um, in there. Um, is it worth it? Secondly, they require a lot of maintenance. Um, the sheeting tends to get um, covered in detritus and dirt. They have to be an algae and have to be cleaned quite often. Um, and they're very susceptible to wind damage in particular. So um, you have to put them in a really sheltered spot. And I learned that um, the hard way in terms of my own greenhouse that got destroyed. Um, and that was right behind me here. Um, so uh, you often have to replace the plastic sheeting on polytunnels, which is not cheap. Um, the other consideration is that, you know, you have a very limited amount of space. And for me, as someone who's trying to be self-sufficient, trying to produce as much food as I can, certainly enough for myself um, year round, um, and even a surplus to sell and generate a bit of extra money, um, even a big polytunnel just wouldn't give me enough space to do that. Um, if it's something that you're doing as a bit of a novelty, just, um, to see if you can have some success, then um, it probably would be enough space. But for me, it just wouldn't. Um, now, that's not to say that I don't at some point plan on getting a polytunnel, because I do. But the point for me would be to allow me to, um, first of all, grow things more easily during the winter. So a polytunnel lets you grow things like spinach and lettuce, um, greens, leafy greens in those cold months which you certainly can't do outside um, here in Ireland, even though we have quite mild winters. Um, the other thing that a polytunnel lets you do is you can grow all those extra things that require heat in the late summer to ripen. Um, so things like grapes, um, things like aubergine, um, peppers, uh, sweet potatoes, um, and certainly tomatoes will do better in polytunnels, you'll get a bigger crop. Um, but you can grow them outside. I did it successfully last year. Um, so there are lots of extra things that you can grow if you have um, a polytunnel um, or a greenhouse and you can grow things out of season. That's the huge advantage of them as far as I'm concerned. And if I do get one at some point, it will be for those reasons. I certainly won't be growing things like broccoli or carrots or kale or um, beetroot, things like that, which really don't need a polytunnel to grow successfully.
So behind me, as well as the cottage, you can see this, which is my homemade propagator. And I use this to germinate seedlings um, a few weeks or maybe a month earlier than I otherwise would be able to. So it allows you to start um, seedlings off maybe in late February or March rather than having to wait until um, at least April as you normally would. So it's a really huge advantage in getting things started earlier. And the earlier that you can start things, the more time they have outside later in the year to ripen. So this is particularly important with things that produce fruit, things like tomatoes. So um, the main component of this propagator is this, which is an electric blanket designed to go on someone's bed. And indeed, it did go on my bed in the caravan for about a year until I realized that I prefer hot water bottles and decided to convert it into a, um, a propagator for my seedlings to keep them cozy and warm. Um, so the electric, electric blanket is just in here with a piece of aero board, which is um, solid insulation. I think that cost me about two euro from a, a building supplier um, directly underneath the electric blanket. And the purpose of that is to reflect the heat back up and push it back up into the soil. Um, a bit of black plastic over the top just um, to keep the moisture out from the electric blanket, although it is um, capable of getting wet. That was something I checked before I converted it. Um, and then a really simple framework on the top, um, just made with bits of this uh, corrugated plastic, um, which you can get in garden centers, and a few bits of wood um, to make a frame that I had left over. So it probably cost me less than 10 euro to make. Um, you can buy these, you can buy very expensive ones that have a thermostat so you can control the temperature. Um, I don't think you really need something that fancy. I think this um, does the do job just as well. If you whack it onto the maximum heat and um, warm up that soil, then um, it gives you a huge advantage in propagating uh, seedlings early. So most seeds need three things to germinate. They need moisture or water, they need oxygen to respire, and they need warmth. And a propagator like this will provide the third thing most crucially, and that's warmth. But of course, you don't need to put this on a windowsill or somewhere bright. Um, you can put it in your garage. It can be perfectly dark and they'll still germinate as long as they've got those three things. Um, the most important thing that this gives the seeds is warmth overnight. Um, you can have some really sunny, bright days in March or in April, um, but if it still gets cold overnight, then that, the seeds won't germinate or they might germinate and then die because it's just too cold overnight. Um, so the great thing about a propagator is it allows you to control that temperature um, 24 hours, so for the entire cycle of the day, for a, a couple of weeks while the seeds are germinating. Um, as soon as they start to push up through the soil, make sure you transfer the trays or the pots outside into the light or onto a windowsill, somewhere where they can start to photosynthesize. Um, otherwise, they'll get really spindly and thin and weak, and then you'll have, well, they just won't do very well. So really important once they start to push up that you move them somewhere else. But a propagator for the purpose of germinating seeds is an absolutely fantastic thing that you can make yourself for virtually nothing. So this is stage two in the process. Um, and this is a little structure that I built to replace um, part of my greenhouse. Um, it's not enclosed on either end, so it's only a degree or two warmer than the outside air usually. But what it does do is it um, kind of slows down the force of the wind. And we do get really strong winds here um, blowing in from the west. Um, and this is on quite a hilly spot. Um, terrible place to build a greenhouse. <laughs> but um, with this structure, it just allows me to put the seedlings in here in the trays and the pots and just harden them off to use gardening parlance um, for a couple of weeks or maybe a month with some of them. Um, which just gives them time to get used to the conditions. And because this roof, I designed it in such a way that it folds and lifts off, which I'll demonstrate in a second. Um, because it does that, it allows me to expose them to a bit of uh, wind, a little bit of breeze and, and um, um, slightly colder temperatures for a couple of hours each day and just kind of get used to um, the conditions before they're then planted out into the soil. Um, and that's a really important thing to do if you intend to um, grow things outside. 
Um, if you just plant directly into the soil outside, you'll find um, you have a much lower germination rate with seeds. And even if you buy plants directly from the garden center and plant them outside, um, you'll find things get hit hard by pests and diseases and they're quite vulnerable to begin with. So the hardening off stage um, I've found to be quite important. And you can see in there at the moment, there is everything from leeks here at the front, which I've just potted on, um, to peas and beans, beetroot, tomatoes. Uh, what else have we got? Kohlrabi, turnips, sunflowers. There's some pumpkins in pots at the back, some chamomile, um, some lettuce, some parsnips. There's a whole mix of things. Um, half of them I've already planted out, but uh, these ones needed a bit longer. I planted them more recently. So if you have a fairly sheltered garden, you don't need to build something like this to harden off um, your seedlings. Um, all you need to do is put them outside and cover them either in something like this, which is um, fleece that you can get from the garden center, um, or something like this, which is the same kind of plastic sheeting that um, polytunnels are covered with, and you can buy it dirt cheap on the internet. And just give them a chance to get used to being outside without immediately being planted out into the ground. That's really all this is for. So while I've got fleece on the brain, I'll talk quickly about my potatoes because in previous years I've lost potatoes to frost. They're particularly vulnerable when they're young and the shoots and stems come up in April or early May. If you get a frost, then it can completely wipe them out. Um, so this year I invested in some of this fleece um, and as soon as I planted the potatoes out, I covered the entire row in this fleece and I just left it there until the plants were too big to maintain it, at which point I just kind of rolled it back towards the edge. Um, and we, once again, we got a late frost in, um, in May, at the beginning of May. And um, if I hadn't have had that fleece, I think half of the plants would have been wiped out. So um, it's really useful stuff and you can use it on other types of plant as well. So after two or three weeks, all my veggies go from that sheltered area to being planted out. And you can see in one section here, we've got carrots over there and parsnips. And these are cauliflower and kohlrabi, I think, at that end. We've got some cabbage, summer cabbage. We've got some spinach and some lettuce, some radishes, all sorts of different things here. And um, you don't want to leave things in pots and trays for too long. Um, even if they seem to be doing really well, because what happens is they get root bound, which is where the roots start to twist around and grow back in on themselves um, because they're reaching the edge and the bottom of the pot or the tray. And the problem with that is when you then transplant them out, it takes longer for the new roots to push out into the soil and it can be less stable. Um, so you want to be planting them out ideally right at the point where the roots are just starting to touch the edge of their container. Now, the first thing that I do when I plant things out is that I cover each seedling in one of these. And this is just cut from um, a plastic water bottle. Um, and it has to be, in my opinion, the ultimate act of recycling, particularly as there's no facilities around here to recycle plastic. Um, so far better than just sending them off to landfill or burning them. Um, I get to uh, repurpose them um, to protect um, my little seedlings as they're growing. And I have about, oh, it must be close to 300 of these now, which I've cut and fashioned over the years um, since moving here. I never throw these things out. Um, one of my outbuildings is gradually filling up with um, little plastic containers, but they are really, really effective and useful and not enough people use these things. Um, I think there's a kind of uh, negative image associated with sticking bits of old plastic on your vegetable plot. Um, but when it comes to self-sufficiency and repurposing things um, and protecting your young seedlings, these are definitely the way to go. So what do these things actually do? What are they useful for? Well, first of all, they keep out most of the slugs and snails. And anyone who's tried to grow veggies outside will know that slugs and snails are the most voracious and damaging of pests. 
um, particularly in somewhere like Ireland with a, a, a very wet climate. Um, this, these won't keep out all of the slugs and snails, some of them will still get in, but um, you certainly won't lose entire crops if you cover them in these. And what I do is the, the, the plastic caps on the seedlings at the end of the row, I cover in a little bit of that copper foil um, that you can buy in garden centres um, and the slugs and snails won't go over the copper. It has some kind of electrical effect that uh, they dislike. So um, I, only the ones at the end of the row, I put a little bit of this tape on um, because of course the slugs and snails, they hide where the vegetation is. So the plants at the end of the rows are much more vulnerable. The second thing that these do is they stop the birds from hopping along the row, particularly robins and blackbirds are, are absolute devils for this and turning up young seedlings looking for worms and bugs um, beneath the roots and in the growing area. And I have um, watched um, birds hop along an entire row of things that I've just planted out and completely turn up every one. And if it's a sunny day, the roots will get dehydrated and the seedling will die really quickly. So this completely protects the um, seedlings from birds and bird damage. Thirdly, they create a wind barrier and if you live somewhere windy like the west of Ireland, um, and I'm in a particularly windy spot because there's, <laughs> there's fields right next to uh, my cottage, then these things will protect your seedlings um, until they get a bit established. And with one of these over the seedling, there's no way the wind can completely blow it over. So it'll keep them upright and growing upwards. Fourthly, um, it creates a really easy way to water plants because if you stick that on your seedling, then um, you can pour the water directly around the seedling and it holds it in that area. Moss doesn't like them very much. <laughs> um, but it contains the water around the seedling, so it makes them much easier um, to be watered. Finally, um, it creates a little mini greenhouse around the stem of the um, the growing plant. So it just maybe adds a degree or two of warmth, particularly to the soil at the base of the plant. Um, and that might not seem like much, but um, it can make the difference between a plant which is going to be in, in what's called transplant shock when it's first um, planted out into the soil, um, between it living and dying. So, And here we have the extra large deluxe version made from uh, five litre water bottles um, and these things are really fantastic. You are basically creating a mini greenhouse around the plant. Um, but I buy these things anyway for drinking water. And uh, so for me, it's the perfect way to recycle them. Um, uh, all I do is I cut the bottoms off. Let me show you one now. I just cut the bottoms off, uh, take the cap off the top, and then push it down around the um, seedling. And these really do increase the temperature um, particularly when the sun's out um, around the plant and they also trap humidity. So plants that need a lot of moisture, um, they're really great for them. Um, I tend to leave these on um, for maybe two or three weeks if I can, um, depending on the plant. Um, but once the leaves start to push out and you can see that it's um, clamoring for a bit more space, I'll take them off and move them onto something else. And I give priority to the plants that need that extra heat, particularly things like um, tomatoes, pumpkins, um, any member of the squash family, uh, uh, what else, sunflowers. Um, but uh, sometimes I'll just put them on beetroot like I did here. This is a, a heritage variety of beetroot and um, ah! <laughs> I haven't tried to grow them before, so I'm not sure how successful they'll be. Um, so I thought I'd give them a bit of a head start with these. So then there's weeding. If you let weeds grow around your vegetable crops, they'll steal nutrients out of the ground, they'll block light, um, and they can sometimes even throttle the growing vegetable seedlings. So you definitely don't want to let them um, survive, even though it's a bit brutal committing genocide to weeds and slugs. Um, unfortunately, it can be necessary if you want to have a successful crop. Now, when it comes to weeding, I use one of these. Um, if you go into a garden center or a tool shop, you'll see this type of hoe. 
and it is by far and away the most effective way to take out young weeds and that's the key you've got to do it when they're young um, and then you can just kind of push this along the soil and um, it roots them out and that you just leave them to desiccate and dry out in the sun so it's an activity best done on a very sunny day So another thing you'll need lots of if you're growing vegetables outside is compost. Really important for um, soil structure and soil fertility, for adding your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium back into the soil. Um, and you can make your own compost. This is my composting area, newly created this year. Um, it's doing a final job of turning wood chips and um, weeds that haven't gone to seed and grass cuttings and cardboard and kitchen waste and various other things back into very healthy fertile soil. Um, I'd really recommend anyone out there who's interested in growing vegetables in doing some research into how to compost. In fact I'm going to make a video on that very subject um, in the near future so look out for that. So one final thing that I'll mention is crop rotation. Um, it's fairly obvious stuff but um, rotating crops, um, i.e. not growing the same thing on the same patch each year, um, helps to fight against soil-borne diseases, things like club root, which destroy brassicas, so kales and cabbages and, and broccoli. Um, and it helps fight against pests. Um, and it also allows different plants to access nutrients at different levels in the soil. So crop rotation is a really important thing. There's tons of information out there on the internet. Um, about the best way to do it. It depends where you live and what type of things you want to grow. Um, but behind me you'll see there's, there's three plots. This area over here was chickens last year. Um, I don't know if you remember my chicken coop video, but that's where I had them back then. And then this area in the middle, um, this year it's uh, more my kind of summer crop where it was all brassicas last year. And this area over here is now chickens, which was my summer crop. So all these areas this year have been rotated and changed from the previous year and it might sound like a lot of hard work but um, it really does make a difference in terms of uh, how productive and how much your crop will yield so it's an important thing to do. So that's kind of it for this video I hope it's been useful and might even have inspired a few of you to go out there and give vegetable growing a, a try for the first time um, without I should add feeling like you need to spend hundreds or thousands on a polytunnel or a greenhouse or all the other paraphernalia that you see in garden centers and online these days. I think it's kind of sad that um, growing food has become um, an industry, a way to take money off people um, rather than what it used to be, which was a way for people to save money and provide for themselves. Um, so if there's ever there's an opportunity for me to recycle something or reuse it or do something more economically, more simply, then that's what I always try and do. It really is amazing what you can grow and produce with just the earth, the sun and perhaps a few hundred plastic bottles. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. couple of raised beds which I use for um, that would be Elvis my cockerel wants to make a contribution to the video um, he might make a few more as uh, time goes on as well um, I hope you can hear me over him because he's quite a loud bugger so when <laughs> it's not one it's the other so this is the area that I had my greenhouse in and that's moss sneezing um, and when that was destroyed um, a few years ago, so you can kind of expose um, your seedlings <laughs> um, without using um, protective cropping like a greenhouse or a polytunnel. Hardening plants off, so once I've propagated them, 